Heavy rain signals the start of the Indian monsoon. It can actually be as much as 9,000 millimetres in just one month on the upslopes of the Himalayas, and that's 354 inches. The formation of dust storms in the Middle East. Known locally as the 40-day wind, it can blow southeastwards almost continually throughout the months of June and July. And counting the cost of climate change. We know that the climate is changing around us. The Bank of England is one of the first central banks to look at this in a serious way. It's Friday the 11th of June and you're listening to Weathersnap from the Met Office. Hello, welcome to Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir. June typically marks the onset of monsoonal rains across the Indian subcontinent. And although it may only be the 10th day of the month, India has already experienced some intense wet weather. Here with more details, Senior Global Guidance Meteorologist Paul Hutchin. The Southwest Monsoon is also actually known as the Indian Summer Monsoon and the South Asian Monsoon. And it occurs due to an intense heating of the Tibetan Plateau in the late spring and the summer months. And that results in a large scale south to southwesterly flow uh, moving north from the Indian Ocean. And that brings high amounts of moisture that then rains out across the Indian subcontinent. And that produces uh, extremely large amounts of, of rainfall. And it can actually be as much as 9,000 millimetres in just one month on the upslopes of the Himalayas, and that's uh, 354 inches. Just to compare that to what we see in the UK, uh, just looking at Glasgow, for instance, that's nine times the average annual rainfall. And this rainfall is really important because some parts of the country don't have a lot of rain through the other times of the year. So they rely on this rain fundamentally, don't they, for farming, for obviously water resources, for everything. Yes, that's right. The Indian summer monsoon really brings the vast majority of rainfall through the year to most of the Indian subcontinent. And then in years where it doesn't rain as much as it should do, it can then lead to to drought conditions. And especially if they get uh, two or three poor monsoon seasons in a row. But also when you see extreme rainfall, you can get uh, severe flooding, flash flooding and river flooding as well. So tell me, Paul, what's happening right now? So we're at the beginning of the southwest monsoon season. Where is the rain right now and how much are we seeing? The monsoon this year actually commenced two days later than the uh, the usual date. The usual date is the 1st of June. In the last week, uh, the monsoon really has uh, progressed northwards quite quickly. It's now ahead of where it should be. So it's up into um, central parts of western India and also up into Bangladesh as well. And as we go through the next uh, week or two, it looks like it's going to accelerate northwards and become quite active. When you say active, it's not the rain that we would call active. There's a huge amount of buckets, loads of the stuff. And the land obviously can cope with it because it should see it every year. But there is always the risk of flooding and I presume landslides in mountainous areas. That's right. I mean, at this time of the year, the continent has just gone through a dry period. So the initial heavy rainfall causes um, some flash flooding, especially in in the the urban areas. But uh, in many respects, it's actually welcome rain because it breaks the intense heat that you can get before the monsoon starts. Senior Global Guidance Meteorologist Paul Hutchin. And you can find out more on the progress of the southwest monsoon at the Indian Met Department website, imd.gov.in. Staying with global weather, forecasts suggest an intense shamal wind is developing across Iraq, with the risk of severe dust storms across the northern and central Gulf states. To tell us more about the origin and nature of shamal wind, his senior meteorologist, Helen Roberts. Like many locally named winds around the world, the Shamal has its own unique fingerprint and can generate great dust storms that extend for hundreds of miles. Shamal means north in Arabic, as this hot, dusty, low-level wind blows from the north. Although the Shamal forms during the Middle Eastern winter, it's most prolific in the summer across the Arabian Peninsula. Known locally as the 40-day wind, it can blow southeastwards almost continually throughout the months of June and July. 
In doing so, huge amounts of dust may be swept from Iraq across the Persian Gulf states and Saudi Arabia towards the Arabian Sea. The Shamal develops as a result of high pressure to the west and low pressure to the east across Iran, producing a distinct, strong northwesterly flow, which may be further intensified by passing storms or a cold front. Although wind strength varies, there may be many days in which wind speeds reach 30 or 40 miles per hour. This may generate large waves and rough seas in the Persian Gulf, while bringing an increased risk of sandstorms downwind. The main risk associated with the Shamal wind is the high volume of dust lifted into the atmosphere. This not only creates poor visibility, but chokes the air with dirt, making breathing difficult. This together with extreme heat can make for oppressive conditions in the Middle East in summer. Estimating the economic risks posed by climate change requires financial expertise and heavy scientific computing power, and the Met Office Hadley Centre certainly has the latter. The financial implications of climate change are far-reaching, and Met Office climate projections are already used by a broad range of businesses and government agencies. This week, the Bank of England announced a new partnership with the Met Office, one of its aims to translate climate data into pounds and pennies. To find out more, I spoke to climate correspondent Graham Madge. For some time, the Met Office has been working with a range of sectors, looking at climate risk through the energy sector, the water sector. And now we're delighted that the Bank of England has come to us wanting to understand more about climate risk and how it may affect the financial sector. So the Bank of England will be using in part our climate projections, UKCP, to understand two elements of climate risk. And first of all, that's things like the impacts on property, the physical impacts, if you like. And then secondly, they'll also be looking at what are called transition risks. And these are where as the UK and the globe begin to transition to a net zero economy, it's understanding that there will be some financial assets and some sectors which may have associated risks with it, the fossil fuel sector, for example. So it's important for the bank to understand what exposure the UK financial sector has to climate risk. And obviously, that's something that needs to be assessed alongside all of those other factors, which climate change is forcing decision makers and governments to think about on a daily basis. Why is it so necessary now? We're beginning to understand more about how the climate will change. The technology that helps us to produce climate projections is getting better all of the time. And it's important to understand more about climate risk. We know that the climate is changing around us. We know that we're likely to suffer more extreme heat waves, droughts, potential flooding events. And it's prudent for the financial sector, and the Bank of England is one of the first central banks to look at this in a serious way, to understand risks to the economy. So we're talking here about climate change risk investments and future investments as well, because obviously everyone needs cover when it comes to insurance, whether you're building a skyscraper or developing a farm somewhere. Well, already we've seen damage to property from climate change events, and we know from the projections that that is likely to increase. So we think it's prudent that the Bank of England look at the risks associated with threats to infrastructure or investments one thing that's clear is that business is going to have to adapt and transform to cope with climate change. And that will be everything from adapting supply chains to looking at future investments. Graham Madge, thank you very much. Heat has been building across the UK this week. So how will we fix for sunshine into the weekend? Here's Alex Deacon. Lots of highs to talk about this weekend. High pressure, high temperatures 
but also high pollen and high UV. In fact, very high grass pollen levels and UV levels across parts of the UK this weekend. So not great news for hay fever sufferers and make sure you slap on the sunscreen. But plenty of blue sky to be seen this weekend as well. If you like your summer days long and sunny, then you should enjoy it this weekend. Now, it will start a little fresher on Saturday morning, a cold front going through, introducing slightly cooler conditions to begin the day. And temperatures on Saturday will peak in the afternoon around average, so high teens, low 20s, maybe 25 across the southeast. There will be a few showers across the far north of Scotland on Saturday and a brisk breeze, but otherwise dry and bright with spells of sunshine. Staying fine through Saturday night as well. And then a hotter day on Sunday. Temperatures generally a few degrees higher. There will be another weather front bringing some cloud and patchy rain to western Scotland, particularly the Highlands and the Western Isles. And it may be a little cloudier in Northern Ireland too. But again, for most on Sunday, it is all about the temperatures. More widely over 20, 22 to 25. But in the southeast, we're expecting a high of 29. Now, Sunday's interesting because it's the 13th of June, and that is the only date in meteorological summer that we have never recorded 30 Celsius. We're going to be close this year, so that is one to watch. Make sure you're following the Met Office on social media for updates on that through Sunday. But yes, another very warm day on Sunday. The temperature is likely to peak on Monday, where we are expected to get over 30 Celsius across the southeast. Things could turn thundery, though, as we go through next week. But quite a bit of uncertainty on that one. Thanks, Alex. Now, with last week's highs and lows, Martin Bowles. Here are the weather extremes for last week, observed between Monday the 31st of May and Sunday the 6th of June. After a cold and rather wet May, Temperatures rose on cue for the start of June and of meteorological summer. Daytime temperatures rose into the 20s in many places. The highest was 28.3 Celsius at RAF North Holt in Greater London on Wednesday. The lowest minimum temperature was plus 1.5 Celsius at Eskdale Muir in Dumfrieshire, Scotland in the early hours of Saturday morning. There was plenty of sunshine in many places last week. The highest measured amount in a day was 15.8 hours, recorded at Morecambe in Lancashire on Monday and also at Aberdeen Airport in Dice on Saturday. The largest rainfall totals were associated with heavy summer showers. The largest value recorded in a single day was at Brooms Balm in Suffolk on Friday when 28.8 millimetres fell. Thanks Martin. That's it for Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir. Editor is Adrian Holloway. Weather Snap is a podcast by the UK Met Office.